Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 281. Today, Larissa Huff joins me and Vic, and we talk about disc sanders and possibly making a disc sander from your table saw, what to do when the live edge table police come after you, our ideal shop carts, and last but not least, milling and how much you can take off of board at once. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that this is going to be the last episode of the year. We're going to be taking off the slot of December 30th, but we will be back in the new year. And we've got a lot of really cool stuff planned for next year and a lot of, well, some surprises actually. But honestly, thank you so much for listening to Shop Talk Live and becoming members of Fine Woodworking and subscribers to Fine Woodworking. It is because of you that we're able to do this and make great woodworking content that is not based on an algorithm. We're able to make woodworking content that we feel needs to be made. And thank you for keeping Fine Woodworking algorithm free. And thank you for listening to Shop Talk Live. You are the diehard Fine Woodworking fans and we truly appreciate everything you do for us. So thank you. All right. On with the episode. We just want to talk about woodworking. That's all. Totally. <laughs> so, um, Vic and I, right before you came on, we were talking about, oh, well, it looks like Larissa's moving shop again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure am. <laughs> why, like, why is it our circle of people can never, like, stop Stay still. moving the shop? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty consistent that somebody on the podcast is going to be in the middle of a shop move. It's good for the soul to shake it up and be <laughs> highly inconvenienced for extended periods of time. Agreed, one hundred percent. So, so you're in with with uh, Eric Curtis. It looks like, right? Yes. And it looks huge. It is seventeen hundred square feet. Okay. Yeah. That's a good size. It's not huge, huge. Yes, it is reasonable. And we're hoping to be able to run like two or three person classes or do like one on one stuff in there. So we want to have a little extra room for that. Are you um, is it just you and Eric? Um, there is a pending third person. OK. Yeah. Is it me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> as long as you can. Travel daily down to Philly, Vic. Yes. Is that in the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do that because people from Philadelphia already have like a. <laughs> do they have a hockey team? <laughs> do they? Yeah. Flyers. The, the, the Flyers, right? <laughs> the yeah, oh, my goodness. I knew, the, I knew a hockey team. Wow. Okay. Well, Vic's in. <laughs> <laughs> well, just asking if they had a team makes me. The jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it makes you very Canadian. That's all. Well, yeah. Fair. <laughs> yeah. Fair. So, uh, all right. So, so machines are moved in. You're setting up electric, it looks like. Yes. Yeah, so they're running 220 lines, hopefully this week. Um, yeah. And then we'll have to run some other lines around. And I think we're going to like build walls right through the middle. It was like posts that drop through the center. They're going to wall off the machines from the benches. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So that it will reduce noise and dust. Um, so there's, I mean, there's work to be done. I think we will be able to actually like use tools within the next two weeks. So okay. it, like imminent things can be done, but it won't like be fully built out for a while. So, so f the whole setting up a, a shop mate thing. Is yeah. that like the awkward moment where you like ask someone to be your roommate in college? <laughs> what an amazing question. <laughs> um, in this case, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I was thinking you got a bandsaw and I got a planer. And <laughs> Do you want to go oh, steady? <laughs> We had to commit to at least a year together, so it's not okay. nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, um, but Eric is like, I've taught with him. He lives in my neighborhood. He's been a friend for many, many years. And both of us were in a situation where a new shop 
was necessary and made sense. So here we are. Right on. And, there was no and, formal like prom style proposal, although now <laughs> I feel like there should have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lost. You know, that's, that's, that's Maybe just next a, time, I don't yeah, know. yeah, it's, it's, it's a damn shame. That's what that is. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that I've never had a commercial space. I've always had like, my shops have always been either in the basement of my home or in the garage or, or wherever. And so we, um, my partner, Andrea and I were talking about that and we're trying to figure out like, cause when you, when you look for a home, and you have very specific requirements for a shop. Um, it, it makes it makes your pool of where you can buy a house very very limited. Um, whereas, like you know, I could live in a you know I could live in a apartment style condominium and like not have to worry about lawn maintenance and shoveling snow and all that other stuff. But and then but then I have to you have extra rent and and everything t- going towards the. Um, going towards the, um, the business. And so I've always sort of, I've always wondered about that. Like Larissa, do you find that that's a stressor, like having to put out that extra cash for that sort of thing? Like, it's a good question. Um, I love living in the city, so there's no world in which my shop is in my house or like on my property. Um, so it's always been a thing that I factored in and my husband also has a studio So it's just part of our budget to build in our studio spaces. Um, If we should ever move out of the city, I'm sure we will look for a place where one of us can have the studio at home. Um, But it's it's a stressor, but it's also a motivator. Like I have to be working in the shop in order to generate revenue in order to pay for this place. So I have to uh, like I have to actually leave my house and go to work in order to have that space. So. I, I, I like it. It's a good balance for me, especially because I like sharing my shop spaces with people. Sure. Um, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, it's interesting it's you different. say that you're having to get up and go to your shop because like, like the pull to just sit down and, and pl- play the Nintendo Switch is real. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and it's like, ah, oh, do I want to do this today or do I want to go and goof off and... Yeah. So yeah, that's. I think that's, I would just do like a lot of laundry and like house cleaning because on my way out the door, I'm like, oh, I should really do that. I should really do that, but I have to leave. Like I have to leave this place and go to a different place. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's a neat. So, I- that's a neat idea. So com- working alongside other people and everything, we need to talk about your fellowship at Center for Furniture Craftsmanship again with Eric. <laughs> well, we only overlapped by a couple of weeks, but yes. Okay. Yeah, it All was right. there. Yeah. Yeah. So Um, explain to me what a fellowship is at a place like CFC. um, So it's a lot like an artist residency. Um, In this case, I mean, in all cases, you have to apply for it, submit your portfolio, explain why you want to be there. Um, They encourage people who are interested in the social factor as much as the making factor, because there's a lot about it that is learning from the people around you. Okay. So they want you to be engaged with the other people, um, is my understanding. I don't know. I'm not the one reviewing the applications, but that is my understanding. Um, And this one, you have to commit to at least a month, but you can stay for up to a year. So it's very flexible um, in the, like, how long you can and or want to stay once you're accepted. Um, But they're all a little bit different. Every residency is different. Every fellowship is a little different. Some are endowed some you have to pay for it there's a whole range of experiences in this particular like section of woodworking hmm. yeah but what what drew you to it because you're a fairly accomplished woodworker was it just the idea of wandering up to maine for a few weeks and and focusing on your woodworking and not necessarily focusing on paying the bills or, or what what um, so I've always wanted to apply for a residence, a residency or a fellowship, but I couldn't because we were running a school. So I had to be at our shop pretty much all the time. Yeah. Um, so it was part of my first year as a solo woodworker to just try it and see, um, what it was like partially because I wanted to 
work in a beautiful location in a beautiful shop with like the people that are there are just oozing with talent in a way that I cannot express. Like Tim Rousseau is in the building next door. Next door. It's, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. So just to be in a place where I could even absorb a few sentences of their knowledge was a big motivator. Um, but to also set aside two months of my time to make whatever I wanted yeah. without teaching a class or having a commission was a thing I've never done before. Um, so it was risky and maybe not financially the greatest choice, but it was <laughs> rewarding in ways that I can't express. Like I, I would do it every year for the rest of time if I can. That's all. I, I would be so afraid of yeah. like, cause you were there for seven weeks. I was there for two. I extended it by a week. So I was okay. there for two months. Yeah. Uh, but like at the end of the two months, or whatever. I like if I set aside even four weeks to just work on my craft. Yeah. And not be immersed in the rest of life. Yeah. I would have no excuses at the end of it to say, like, <laughs> well, I didn't really get all that much done. And at least now I have really good excuses. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think um, people who, my understanding, Understanding is people who apply have different motivations. Some people just want to practice techniques and actually don't make anything. They just spend that time trying things. Um, and some people have a project in mind, like Eric went with a commission that he had to finish. So everybody shows up with a different idea. And depending on the structure of the residency or the fellowship, you might not be required to have a product at the end. Um, so it's it's very interesting to step away from life and just make things yeah. with people that you've never met before that are making different things. Very cool. The closest yeah, I that's... get is like turning off outlook and slack for like two hours and editing video. I just... It's just like that. It's yeah. like, this <laughs> yeah. but for two months, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I was at Rosewood, um, I, when I graduated, I ended up going back as a resident craftsman. And so it basically was an incubator um, for me to be able to work on commissions and work on things, um, work on a portfolio. So I did all of those things. And then, you know, the only thing I had to do was um, be willing to answer questions from students and do the odd, you know, shop sort of maintenance thing, change planer blades, that sort of thing. And then I would also be... Um, the rented mule for, um, teachers that came in. And so, um, you know, I would basically help them out however they needed. And like some really cool stuff. Like I remember like Garrett hack was up teaching a Demi Loon table class. And I, so I chatted with him and I said, I'm your shop tech for the, for the week. So what can I do for you? And he's like, ah, I don't really like shop techs. He's like, I, he's like, if I need something done, I'll just do it. He says, I just, I don't like being waited on. He said, so why don't you just take the week off and build the table? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so then I built a three-legged Demi Loon table, much to his chagrin, because I had just finished working with Michael Fortune. And I was like, I'm a designer. I don't need to do this the way this was done. And so I made a three-legged table and Garrett was just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're right. Like the... Like you get these teachers coming in and like they're, they're, they're at the top of their game and you're just, you're just a fly on the wall listening and hearing little tidbits. And it's like, oh yeah, that's a smart idea. And, you know, so it just, yeah, it's like, um, it's an invaluable experience. I mean, you just can't, can't put a price on that. Yeah. I know at, at CFC, I've, I've been up there and talking to someone and they were like doing the fellowship and they're like, yeah, my bench mate is yuri kobayashi yeah her bench is next to mine and i was like this is another universe i can't even believe this is happening <laughs> not intimidating that's, at all no. that's cool. <laughs> it's like one of the all-time greats of modern woodworking and yes. she's just there like building away <laughs> yeah i convinced her to go bowling while i was there and it was the greatest night of my whole life <laughs> was there is there is there a bowling lane in what rockport or uh yes a part of what i discovered there's candlepin bowling up there oh yeah my favorite 
and doesn't exist down I down south we're not I'm not down south but further down so I was very excited and I went every Friday for two months <laughs> I don't know what that is candle pimple do you know duck pin bowling nope okay there's a small ball and small yeah. pins that look they're more like like a cylinder as opposed to bowling pin shaped oh okay yeah and, and is there like the machine and it resets everything? There's the machine, but everyone that I've been to, there's a few around here. Everyone that I've been to, you have to like manually tell it to do the things. You have to like hit the foot switch and everything to clear the pins. And oh. Yes, because you yeah. aren't supposed to clear between each roll. So you can use the fallen pins to knock the oh. other pins down. What? So, yeah. So you reset it after three rolls. Oh. And you can like press the button to reset. I've been doing Amazing. that the whole time. Yes. I don't think we have that in Canada. I don't think it's legal. <laughs> Might be Canadian goose bowling. <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to throw a ball at those guys. <laughs> those freaking ninja, ninja chickens. There. <laughs> well, should we answer some questions? We have weird think, questions today. I don't know that they're weird. I I opened it back up today and I was like, wow, I really threw them some oddball ones. <laughs> so we got it. Yeah. I, oh, I'm not worried. Y'all got it. All right. <clears throat> Any particular order? Does anyone want me to start with, with one over the other? It's a great right. array. I don't know. Um, let's see. From John. I constantly have a need to sand radiuses on corners of my projects. So my question is about table saw sanding discs. My shop is small, only about 10 foot by 12 foot. So I do not have room for a dedicated disc sander. Would a table saw sanding disc be a good alternative? Online forums are chocked full of people saying that they would never use one because it would destroy the saw somehow. I'm not sure how true that is. All that said, I could also do what, what, do what I need if I got better with my jigsaw and ran a more of a sander. Maybe I'm overthinking this. And then, for context, I own a saw stop job site saw. And that changes everything for me. So... Poor Larissa. I I texted her I texted her the other day. I was like, you use disc sanders a lot. And I think the reply was, other people have said that to me. I don't know if I use it all that much. But <laughs> outside of myself, I think Larissa, you're the only other person I know who uses a disc sander. So so I don't know, impossible, but I use one. You use one? Yeah. <laughs> See? Okay, Vic, I hardly know you, man. All this time? Uh, well, and we haven't who, talked about who this does it? Thank you. Who doesn't? <laughs> Everyone else I know. Well, I don't um. know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I have a couple Sorry, of thoughts on I, this. I, I, all right. Yeah. I, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Okay, so first of all, don't go to online forums looking for information. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Okay. So I know that there are all kinds of ways that people use the table saw that isn't really how it's designed to be used. So case in point, cutting a cove molding mm -hmm. using the method where you put the sticks on the, you know, sort of perpendicular-ish to the blade and then push wood through it. So you're putting lateral forces For the on. listeners, do not put sticks perpendicular on the blade of your table saw to push wood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We advise against that. Yeah, yeah. We, we, do, we don't condone that sort of behavior. Um, but yeah, so that puts lateral pressure on the blade and, and then by virtue of that, it's putting lateral pressure on the trunnions and the arbor and all that other stuff. So, um, I also know that, um, oh boy, his name just fell out of my head. He sells a product. He Mike Farrington. Not, Mike Farrington has a product that he's designed that he, that it pushes it through and it sands the side as it's going through yeah. And so anyway, all of that to say, I think that you would have to put an enormous amount of force on 
a sanding disc mounted to a table saw to amount to any sort of a problem, right? And I think that's the problem. I think theoretically, there's a lot of people who could say, oh, but you're putting lateral pressure on this and that's going to cause that, right? But how much pressure are we talking about? And that's where the argument falls down because nobody's done the research, right? Nobody can say to me, if you put this many newtons of force against the side of this thing, this is what's going to happen. So now it's all just speculation. And then now you're on a forum and it's a whole bunch of like glasses getting pushed up and, you know, it's like a, it's a bit of a mess. But um, I've used that style of a sanding disc before and I don't, it didn't wreck anything. And it was a piece of poo saw and it, it didn't do any damage. Um, not any that I noticed, you know in in using it so it's nice if you can have a dedicated machine but i think if you're as long as you're not thinking you've got a 16 inch disc where you can just you know lean into it i think it's fine larissa what I mean, I, I guess I have been spoiled. I didn't even know that this was an option until you sent the question. So then I started Googling it and I was like, oh, I I had no idea. But it makes perfect sense that this would be an option. Um, and my first thought was, it seems like it would be the same. And yeah, as long as you're not putting like immense force into it to knock things out of line, I don't see why it would be an issue. I like I'm a big fan of the benchtop ones. Like if you have the space to like tuck it on a shelf underneath something somewhere, like I like a bench top disc sander. I also like cutting things with a jigsaw and then taking like a spoke shave or a hand plane to get rid of the marks and then sanding it also would be a thing I would definitely do without a second thought. So I don't know that I have a firm stance on this. I don't know how the saw stop would feel about that. Like, I guess you'd have to turn the mechanism off. I'm not sure. I don't know. How the sauce feel about adding that, the candy to That's the part that I would really question because all of a sudden you are trying to trick the brain of the table saw, which is a weird statement, um, into everything being okay. And I also wonder, I don't know the mechanism of like how how a saw stop bench top saw is put together but to me anything with a belt is going to have multiple set of bearings and is going to be able to handle this this extra lateral force a little bit better i would worry that if the blade is directly attached to the motor somehow that you might be risking it a little bit like a bench top saw i i wonder if it would if it would wear out a gear faster than you might otherwise want and if you're already in the saw stop world like that's a machine i'm not gonna mess with i think like i because you invested a lot of good money in that saw and i think i would maybe i've seen uh standing discs uh, that attached to the side of a grinder. So if you have a benchtop grinder, you could do that. If you have a lathe, I've, I've made, uh, sanding discs to go on my lathe. Uh, Craig, uh, Thibodeau has one that attaches to the back, um, of his bandsaw. He has an 18 inch bandsaw with, with, the, with the pulley sticks out and he had a plate milled up for that. I think that like you just need to get a disc spinning really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I if I had a Unisaw still or something like that, maybe I could see that. I don't know about a bench top saw stop. Because I really I really want that thing to last. Well, and I think that's part of the problem. I think it's difficult to know like in practical purposes what amount of force is gonna result in some sort of damage. Um, you know, granted saw stop builds most of their tools to an extremely high standard, uh, you know, and, and the trunnions are, you know, they're insanely built because they're designed to take that 
chunk of aluminum flying into a blade and so my sure. you know if you if you think about it that way if you think about the amount of force now granted the force is like kind of in line with the blade blah 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 i'm not an engineer i only that, play one on television but that's but, a really good point yeah but i mean it's designed to take an awful lot uh and so i have a hard time believing that putting a some lateral pressure with a sanding disc is going to cause any sort of it's kind of the same argument as a drum sander on a on a drill press, right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody said, oh, don't use those spindle ones because then, you know, you're going to put lateral pressure on the bearings and then that's going to, you know, you're going to end up with a bunch of run out. And I'm like, okay, well, how much of this is really a problem and how much of it is just speculation based on ignorance? So I just, I don't know. I, I don't put a whole lot of... If a, if a bandsaw comes apart or a drill press comes apart all of a sudden because you were putting pressure on it, well, okay, send us a video and we'll we'll be like, okay, I get it now. You guys yeah, but, got twenty emails. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> great. But that said, if a bandsaw comes apart, I'm pretty sure I could fix it. If a drill press comes apart, I'm pretty sure I can fix it. Yeah. Something happens on the inside of that saw stop, I might be out of luck. It's just parts. Yeah, you can replace parts. Parts, but parts I, I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that has a brain is like the, you know, is the electronics. But I mean, you know, like if a, if you if you wrecked an arbor or if you did something, I mean, you just take that part out, put another part in. I mean, it's just parts. <sighs> I think you're right. Though. I think it would take like a lot, a lot and a lot of like frequency and a lot of force to like do any major damage if we're just talking about rounding the corners of tabletops i don't i think it would be a long time before you would see any fallout any potential fallout on the table saw but i don't know the other way to do it, it would be to just use it. a template and put a template on the corner and then run a router across it and just and be done with it that way yeah don't some companies yep. even main like make like little aluminum thingies that you put on the corner of something and then you can follow it along or whatever yeah i yeah. rockler has them woodpeckers has them uh if right. you got a 3d printer you can 3d print them um yeah i now the other thing is i think if you told me i could either have my disc sander or my table saw i'd, I'd keep the disc sander oh agreed wow i don't own a table <laughs> saw <but. laughs> well it's just so one aspect, as I'm reading this question from John, is like the disc sander for me gets used for like 32 seconds, 14 times a day, mm. you know, and then the table saw is set up for an operation or something like that. It's it's but if I had to tear down my table saw, swap out the blade to put the sanding thing on or whatever, I, I think I would. I'd find a way of fitting a station or a, a, a permanently set up sanding disc some somehow because I use it so much. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. We had, I, the new shop doesn't have one. I was talking to Eric about this when I got the questions and I was like, we have to change this. Cause apparently I am <laughs> the person that uses these things the most. Um, but I, we had one at my last shop that just like sat on, like a corner of a bench and it was like 12 inches or something. It didn't take up a huge amount of space, but it got used like a lot. So. I I've, I've seen uh, an ukulele maker, Aaron Keim. He has his, uh, his disc sander and the vacuum attached to it on a foot switch so that he could just walk over, put his foot down on the switch, yep. zip the thing, and then move on. That's it's the like, next level wow. efficiency. <laughs> and those foot switches are cheap. Like that's an easy, that's an easy fix. Yeah. That, yeah. It, it's, and to have a dedicated vacuum to it and everything, it really makes a lot of sense. It does um, make a lot of sense. But to answer this guy's question, I don't think he needs to worry about wrecking stuff as long as he's not leaning into it. <sighs> yeah. The pressure you're putting on it is a really good point. It's a really, really good point. All right, let's see. Let's go to a question from, this one's fun, from Ken. Um, what is your ideal shop cart? And Larissa, with your 1,700 square foot shop. Right? Um, it's going to have to be a golf cart for Larissa. 
Uh, if you could only have one and why, what dimensions, height, what kind of top? I'm reading it with added enthusiasm because this, yeah, storage or just a cart reserved for project work, drawers, shelves, T-track, tray, vice, any lessons from experience? I I think I read that pretty well, by the way. That was very good. Thanks. (laughs) You should be on audible. (laughs) All right. Oh, you could read my book. On Audible. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Only if you don't quality control it. If I can, like, like mm. s- m- remark on the side. Well, that's not how it works when you read a book. You can't remark on the side. <laughs> it isn't a commentary well, by Ben Well, this is why Strano. I don't get to read audiobooks, see? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right, Larissa. What's your shop cart going to look like? So... Honestly, I thought about this for too long, I think, because I don't know what my ideal shop cart would be. My expectations for a shop cart are small enough that I can move it around in between machines and like park it next to my bench. And if I'm not using it, it can be tucked in a corner and not be in my way. Um, I like shelves. I like nice casters. That is like the thing that can make or break a cart. I wanted to be able to spin on a dime. We had carts at um, Lore Woodworking that had a fifth wheel in the middle. I don't know where they came from. They were salvaged from something. But that fifth wheel was slightly like higher. So you could spin the cart in place and get like around tight corners. It was amazing. <laughs> That's... I am so glad Ken asked this question right now. That Every blows single my time, mind. Larissa, all of a sudden, like both Vic and I wind up speechless, which is saying a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. A fifth wheel so that you can spin yeah, it I on mean, a dime. Would... Yep. And are are the four, all four corners spinny wheels? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, all so wheels could, are spinny. Like, it was just went, yeah, it just went everywhere. It was they were very very handy um yeah and i just like i like shelves i feel like drawers and vices and extra things i will would rather travel to my bench for that kind of thing i don't need it like on the move with me but that's just my workflow wow okay that's awesome yeah those are my thoughts on carts (laughs) i'm like larissa i don't like a ton of features on a cart now I don't. I haven't had a shop in a while that I needed one, but when I, when I did, um, it was literally just a flat surface, and I think there was a sh- one shelf underneath so that you could have multiple sets of like components that you're working on. Um, the one I had was set up so that it was like maybe like a quarter of an inch lower than the out feet of the thickness planer roughly so that you could just like kind of have them fall off onto that. Um, and then, um, and it, uh, it can't have a pair of straight wheels and a pair of spinny wheels Mm -hmm. because that now that forces it to be sort of unidirectional. Mm -hmm. It needs to be able to like spin. I mean, your fifth wheel thing is like next level, but but yeah, it needs to be able to spin around easily. And casters, I agree 100%. If you're going to invest in making stuff like that, you cannot skimp on the casters because you will hate yourself for a long time. <laughs> I built a cart for my MFT table and there's storage underneath for the sustainers and all that other stuff. And like I can take the locks off those wheels and with one finger I can spin that whole thing like wherever I want it. And like, I think the casters cost more than the plywood, which is saying something today. Um, and I don't regret it. Um, have either of you seen the Brian Boggs shop cart article a few issues ago? And it's an easy one to flip right past. Cause you know, I was scrolling through and I was going, shop car. And then the further I looked, it was like, okay, Brian Boggs went Brian Boggs on a shop cart. And I was going to say, if it's Brian Boggs, it's going to be a serious shop cart. It is. 
obviously the work of someone who spent a little too long thinking about this shop cart and like in the best of ways don't get me wrong like I, but I, his I, gig I, is his gig is ergonomics like he mm-hmm. right like he gets it like like he does everything that way it is fully thought through and processed and so his has four spinny wheels i caught that fact by the way all wheels are spinning yeah all right you know what i mean but um <laughs> his his has four spinning wheels but then also but they're they're off center almost like a lumber cart in home depot so they're in the middle of the planes or the sides and the and the like a cross not like yes. a Thank not you. corners. Thank yeah. you. Good wording. Um, but then the corners have legs that come down to just like half of an inch above the floor to keep it from tipping. Ooh. So his can spin on a dime the same way. But I'm wondering if I don't think Brian Boggs listens to this show. But if he did, he might say, I don't know, Larissa Huff's on to something. But um, with the fifth wheel thing. I mean, uh, I didn't invent it. I just, oh, it. Okay. but yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh no, um, you take credit for that, Larissa. You know, right, yeah. <laughs> who's going to fact check that? Give me a break. Um, but anyone who's interested in a shop cart, check out this article. I'll I'll link to it because it is one of those. He has his list of needs precisely of what needs to be on the shop cart. He has you know these four pencils or whatever, and a little thing for earplugs and. But then a little raised up station so that all of these, the earplugs can be there, but then also lumber stacks on top of it if he wants. You know, it's it's a, it's a very, very, very thought thought out. Um, I've never had luck with a shop cart. So I, I, I had one in here one time, and I tried to do the thing where the, um, I would, I put wood on top of, you know, it was one of those Rubbermaid, commercial carts and um i had it so that i would put a couple of pieces of wood on it just one by fours or whatever and that would be the level with the top of my workbench which was good for sliding parts on and off but it just my shop is too cluttered and and small and it was immediately in the way every which way i went so to be fair your cart would have to have four-wheel drive you know, Vic, I always thought that my shop was not that messy until last podcast. And now all of a sudden it's like, wow. Like when Vic sits there and says, I couldn't be in that room. It's so messy. <laughs> Which I know you didn't say that, but it like, that's, 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 that's how I felt. There's and now two I schools. Just, and There's nothing two schools. has changed since then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. In fact, if anything, I look back there and I think you've added to it. But. I know. And now it's just more clutter every which way. And there's a fan over there now because I've been moving fans around. It's just I need a week of not building something in order to clean my shop right now. But you need a residency in your own shop and just worry about <laughs> turn off Outlook, turn off whatever that other app is that you use. Yeah. And just clean. Yeah. Get the boy out there. You've got a you've got a kid. What's the point of having kids yeah, but, if you can't use them? He's not going to do it right. Well, he shoveled the driveway the other or part of the driveway the other day. So he's starting to like pay dividends, but yeah. My shop really is messy. It is. You know what though? It's two schools of thought, right? Like some people, like I like my shop neat because I have students in there a lot and I don't mm-hmm. want it to be a hazard for them and I need to be able to find and grab and as I'm teaching, otherwise I get frustrated because I'm not, you know, I don't want them to have to wait for me to dig something out from underneath something or what have you. So that's the only reason I'm fastidious about it because normally I'm a little piggy. So. In my defense, I know where everything is in this shop. <laughs> <laughs> right. I believe you do. I believe you do. But it was But it just makes for funny comments because everybody yeah. <laughs> can identify with either being really messy or or no. neat. And so it makes good it makes good podcasting. Being was... in a place like CFC is super wild because everything has a place and it's every the entire campus cleans up at four thirty every day, no matter what building you're in. So like the three monthers, the nine monthers and the fellowship building all stop work at four thirty and clean up and do you then sing you the cleanup back. song? 
Clean up. Tidy up. Tidy up. Tidy up. Everybody tidy up. Up, up. There's our next video. Yeah. Our next our next uh, music video. I don't think I have another one in me for a while. <laughs> that last yeah. one was good. Le- uh, yesterday I had to, so I, f- I finally shipped out my buddy's uke and and uh, I was not mentally prepared for it because the I I declared when the case comes in, it goes in the case and gets shipped out that day. And the case was supposed to come in Wednesday, and the case came in yesterday. And I was like, "All right, I'm taking the rest of the day off. I gotta get this done," you know. And then I was like, "Crap, I gotta record it," you know. I gotta, you know. So I set up cameras and and microphones, and all that stuff, and and I was editing it together. And I was like, "I really should have cleaned up like the garbage around my <laughs> shop area, because it's like a nicely lit. Because that window lights up nice, and you know, it was a nicely lit video. And then there's like, you know, a fluff container just sitting in the back and like <laughs> like a random bunch of weird widgets and i was like ah, oh well um all right this next question is from michael and i've never thought about this question me and neither I think <laughs> this is this is nuts but from michael i recently built a hall table out of black walnut and maple The walnut top was left with a natural shaped live edge with no bark. I then proceeded to list it on Facebook Marketplace. Big mistake. First mistake. For a bunch of reasons. (laughs) Well, no, no. He he wrote that. I didn't add that in. I didn't add that in. No, but we agree. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Within 10 minutes, I had two people very rudely tell me that live edge woodwork has to have bark on it to be called live edge. I promptly took down the listing, disgusted by people like that. What do you consider live edge? This is crazy. Super crazy what people get passionate about. (laughs) I don't. So I've never seen a piece of live edge furniture, like even like Nakashima, like original, right? With bark on it. The bark's going to fall off, right? It's going to fall off unless you dip the whole thing in epoxy, which is a thing nowadays, but... I think it's going to, like. Also, bugs are going to want to live there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. You never leave bark on anything. Yeah. I mean, if you do, that's cool. But, like, it's probably going to fall off, right? Yeah. And, like, like, I I guess this ties into last. But, like, now we have the Live Edge Police. Like on trolling Facebook Marketplace, seriously? Yeah, I don't have answers. <laughs> Live okay. edge is just the weighty edge of the board. Like it's yes, nothing more than that. And I mean Nakashima, you said it. There was no bark, no. right? No. Um, I look looked... and a lot of times you'll take the cambium off too, just because it's kind of like sometimes it's a little punky or whatever. But like basically what I've always done, not that I'm an expert at live edge anything, but is just like remove anything that is not firmly attached. uh, And then that's your live edge. I mean, to be honest, the tree's dead. The chainsaw (laughs) fixed that. I mean, to be fair, but. Yeah, live live might be a misleading. (laughs) It's it's not it's not true at all. Maybe I should be on Facebook going that tree's dead. (laughs) (laughs) not live anything (laughs) and i could be a jerk about it don't you know anything i would i would pay ten dollars to see the conversation copy and pasted if you do that's almost 14 canadian you know that eh? (laughs) (laughs) that's serious coin i would i would i would pay you 14 cad for that man all right (laughs) so um and i so eshrick did some live edge ish stuff right or, um, or is it mostly sculpted? It's, I think, yeah, mostly like hand shaped. I'm sure that there's live edge components if they were aesthetically pleasing, but he hand shaped most stuff. Okay. Um, but like we did a fair amount at Lore and it was always stripping of bark, mostly because of the bugs, but also because it will eventually just be dust on the floor. Yeah. Like it's inevitably going to end up that way. 
Plus, so, you can like break the edges and make it like tactile, and it's not like rough and crumbly. I don't know. I feel like I'm getting into dangerous territory. I'm gonna get in trouble on the internet. <laughs> oh, I search. I search out that kind of trouble. <laughs> when dumb stuff like this comes up, where people are like, pol- like as Ben said, policing like what is live edge and what is not. It's like. It's, this isn't even an existential question about, like, what is Live Edge, right? <laughs> right? It's like, literally, bark it's like, or no bark, bark or no bark. And the answer <laughs> is very definitively, no bark. <laughs> so <laughs> Go ahead, write me. <laughs> Vic Teslin Woodworks at gmail.com. I was going to tease it, dude, and you just... <laughs> Send it. So, um, is, since you brought it up, we, we need to explain it, or you need to explain it, because I'm not going to be able to explain it, but uh, the the bug thing, why, is it going to attract bugs? Yeah, I mean, like, powderpuff beetles and stuff are going to move into the cambium later, or the bark, I imagine, I, I mean, I can't make no promises, but I imagine that whether or not you've treated it with finish or not, they're still going to, like, be more interested if there is bark available. There's hidey holes. That's, you yeah. know what I mean? Like spiders would lay eggs in there. And like, yeah. that. it's just, yeah, you'd do, never do Do you want it. a spider table, man? <laughs> Get rid of the bark. Nobody wants spiders in their tables. Unless it's Spider-Man. Well, yeah. No, but, not even uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um... This next one is from Dave. I recently made several interior doors during a remodeling project, shaker style, from Cherry. For the rails and styles, I purchased eight-quarter stock and milled it to square stock that was one and three-eighths of an inch thick. I filled several bins with jointer and planer chips. My question is, once the stock is is jointed flat, and planed parallel from which side of the board? Oh, and sorry, and planed parallel, comma, from which side of the board should the remaining material be removed to achieve the desired thickness? Or should the removal be balanced to maintain some level of equilibrium? Will removal from one side result in a stable board over years of use? And so he's going from eight quarter to an inch and three eighths thick. So he's taken off five eighths. If I math well, oh, math teacher. That was great math. That was very oh, cute. Yeah. Like mental I'm math. still trying to convert it to By math. By the way, <laughs> poor, poor Larissa, after the last one, like I started texting her with math questions. I was like, what kind of math do I need in order to do this? And she was like, oh, that's trigonometry, Ben. I was like, oh, crap. I play that role in many people's lives, and okay. I wanted to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> to be honest, I forgot about that. And there's been occasions where I needed a mathematician and I forgot that I knew one. So get in on our group text. We can just have <laughs> There you go. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I would mute that one because I would I would have nothing to bring to that table. All right. So Larissa, you're milling five eighths of an inch off of eight quarter stock. How you going um, about it? I- have always milled somewhat evenly from both faces because if it's dried air dried in the end or kiln dried theoretically it's the same moisture content all the way through so as you expose either face if you do it evenly then the release of whatever moisture is in there is balanced so it's less likely to move is my practice and understanding of it Um, i'm sure that there are arguments for the heart face or sapwood face losing or gaining more moisture but i'm a big flip it back and forth between each pass and work my way down. That's interesting. I've never thought about because I'm sure there is somebody out there who's sitting there and trying to identify which side of the tree the board came off of and which side's more likely to blah, 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 mm-hmm. thinking of it as part of the tree and not necessarily as the board. Interesting. Well, like when a board warps, right, like it always kind of cups towards the outside of the tree. And so... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is a really interesting question because like I, I've been told it matters, but I'm not convinced it does. And that's just like, you know, when you, someone tells you something about woodworking and then like you could sort of follow it as like gospel and then you, you start to 
you start to question it and all of a sudden you're an atheist. And so, <laughs> um, but the thing that with this was, is like, I actually care more about what I'm left with or what I'm seeing. So I like using sapwood in pieces because in some cases I like the reminder that it's a tree and like all that other stuff. And so, and like a lot of times sapwood, like, you know, you'll have like a pie shape of it in a corner. And then if you mill too much off of one side, you lose it, or you purposefully mill more off that side. So you lose it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I find if I'm removing that much material, um, or if I'm going to resaw it, I resaw it like, okay, so that's not the question, but in the case of eight quarter stock, if I was removing that much material, I would remove half an inch instead of five eighths. And then I would just let it rest for the day. Mm -hmm. And then I would do one more milling to, cause if it does, right. It's kind of like, like I was baptized Catholic as a baby. And so I'm, I'm in. <laughs> so if I have to hedge my bets, you know, if it turns out it's true, I'd be like, Oh, Okay. You know, um, analogy is very good. This is, I'm just saying, I've got the card, I can get in, but I just, I don't know if I'm going to need the card. So, so all of that to say, I think like it makes sense if you're going to remove a, I consider that a fair amount of material to come off of a board. Yeah. If I am going to remove that much material or if I'm going to resaw eight quarters and open it up, I'm not going to resaw it and then take more material off and then hope it stays flat. I think you can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be some movement. Um, but yeah, I'm with you, Larissa. I don't know if there's like one side that matters more than the other or like if that's, you know, but I just, I do it in two phases if I'm going to do that much material removal. Yeah, I agree. Like a tabletop, for example, I'll resaw the boards open and then I'll just put them aside and not even look at them until the undercarriage is done. And then I'll go look at them and they'll probably have had a week or so to do whatever they're going to do. And then when I mill it, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be okay. I don't know. So like I always say, oh, I'm going to flip it after every pass or whatever. But then I'll be thinking about something else. I'll be like, how long has it been since I flipped this board? You know, so like uh, the, I'm with you, Vic, where it's like that, that whatever face I want to bring out takes precedent over everything else. Mm -hmm. And I know I should be flipping it, but it's pretty likely that I'm not flipping it. Um, so I, I think, I think, yeah, I'm always playing that sapwood game. Same as you. I'm always like trying to either get rid of it or bring it out. And um, I get the one face flat and then whatever happens, happens after that. But dealing with eight quarter, five eighths of an inch off of eight quarter, that is a lot of wood to remove. I, I would debate if, if I would resaw some off of each side, even if you want to do it evenly, like, you know, take off um, three eighths of an inch or, or, you know, no, take off, do a couple of three sixteenths passes off of each side and then mill it out from there. And then have those three sixteenths pieces yeah. hide in your shop for 20 years saying, Oh, I'll use those. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yep. I think it's the same argument. Like when people talk about like doing a tabletop and, and ring orientation, mm -hmm. right? Smile yeah. up, smile down, smile up, smile down. I'm like, I never follow that. Yeah, I flip boards until I get a picture that I like, yeah. and that's it. It, it. And if they're all down, yeah. great. Like I'll yeah. deal with it. I mean, yeah, I don't worry about it too much. Yeah, totally. All right, so shooting from the hip, we have time for another question. Pulling this out, and this one just happens to be a question for Vic. Uh, says nice. I don't things think that's fair Vic. to Larissa. <laughs> I'm okay well, with it. <laughs> all right. Let's see. I'm wondering if he could talk about his pulling style hand plane he mentioned in a past article, specifically how Vic feels about performance in comparison to a traditional Krenov style plane, uh, as well as bed angle selection for either style. So Vic, do you 
think there's a difference between your your pulling style plane and a Krenov style that you might have made in the past? I don't think so. Um, so f- first off, the only thing that this plane has in common with a quote unquote Japanese plane is the fact that you pull it instead of push it. So d- like there's none of the none of the hot like curve like sections removed from the bottom of the sole and there's none of the like you know hand fettled there's none of that it is literally a Cronovian style plane in that it's like a sandwich build right so you have the front core the rear core two cheeks slap it together wedge done um the thing I liked about Japanese planes was I enjoyed pulling the plane towards me because I just felt I had more control It had nothing to do. I found that I would get less, you know, sometimes when you're like coming off of your hand plane stroke, like if you put a little bit too much pressure on the knob at the front, you're going to get a little bit of a fall off there. And then you're going to have like a little bit of an area that's a little thinner at the end or whatever. And the same thing can can happen at the other end of the cut where you're starting. If you put too much downward pressure on the tote, then you end up, you know, making barrel staves is essentially what you're doing, Um, which is great if you're making barrels horrible for regular furniture (laughs) so i just found with the with the pull style plane because the majority of the plane is on the workpiece already then when you pull it towards you you've got all your downward pressure at that start and then when it comes to the end of the cut it's not like at the end of the cut with a regular plane you're doing that right you're like you've got friction and then oh and then you sort of fall off Whereas with this, you kind of, and then it just, it gets absorbed into your body. And so I find that I have a little bit more control when I'm hand planing. And so I was finding that I was getting better results from my smoothing operations. And so, yeah, so I just sort of, but what I didn't like was I didn't like the fussiness of a Japanese plane. And I, I don't want to like I don't want to ignite a fire here and have like a bunch of Andrew, traditional. Andrew ch- Hunter's coming for you, man. Yeah, no, no, no. I get it. And I mean, I had a great conversation with Andrew Hunter uh, at one of the uh, Fine Woodworking Live uh, events where I was like kind of picking his brain a little bit and asking him about it. And it just it's it was it was beyond what I wanted to do to make a hand tool. Like the nice thing about building a Krenov style plane is that you can do it in a couple of hours. Right. Like I can go from no plane to a plane, not including glue drying in about two hours. (laughs) And so they're not hard to make. They're they're pretty quick and um, people put way too much thought into making them. um, So they're pretty easy. So I just I wanted something that was as easy to make as a Cronovian style plane. But had the pull. Feature to it. So I just made another one, like a little a little one that looks like a block plane. And again, like when I'm like taking the heiresses off of corners and stuff, like I just, I find pulling it, I just feel like I have more control. That's all it really boils down to. Hmm. I don't think it's better. And I, I mean, I guess it goes for, you know, what bed angle and whatever you, you just, if you want another bed angle, you just make another one and wait two hours, right? Well, I... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be fair, like I, it doesn't, like I don't subscribe to any particular bed angle. Like, I mean, you know, the Japanese, a lot of time their planes are bedded at around like 37 degrees. Um, You know, uh, Western style planes are usually sit around 45. They're always beveled down, the planes that I'm making, um, because I don't think you can get like a, a wooden plane with a sole like 12 degrees to be stable enough i think it starts to flex and gets problematic um but yeah i mean you could make whatever angle you want and that's the beauty of making wooden planes is that if you want like a 55 degree smoother for handling whatever curly babinga or something then then there you go you got a plane that can do that um you know or you can do like what um h&t gordon does is that he beds them at 45 degrees but then he encourages you to flip it to a bevel up plane and so now you've got the angle of your blade plus the angle of your bed so now you're scraping and that works really well so there's all kinds of cool things that you can do with them but i don't think like you make whatever angle you want if you need a plane that is 
40 degrees, then try it. Try it at 40 degrees. That'd be a great plane for doing like, you know, calm cherry and walnut and um, pine and all those sorts of things. Cool. It's going to suck in rosewood, though. <laughs> <laughs> have you made a plane, Larissa? I have not. I haven't not. either. Sounds like I should. Uh, I kind of want to make one. I kind of want to make one yeah. in the next... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I want to do in the next year. Well, I mean, but... we're like within eight hours of each other. Like, let's just get together. Okay. And we'll make some planes. <laughs> yeah. That, just not in Ben's shop. You want to be in Maine. Just not in Ben's shop. <laughs> Jeez, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's 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 meet up at CFC. And just make planes. Uh, we'll just we'll just have to clean up at 4 30 with everyone else, right? It is a wonderful place to be. Yeah, I love that area. Oh. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, if I have a random recommendation um, before we leave. Uh, Madison Cunningham's new record is fantastic, and I don't have Apple Music pulled up right now to tell you the name of it. But uh, check out Madison Cunningham if you're into like weird, like indie pop. Not pop. I don't know. If you're into weird music like me, check out Madison Cunningham. If you're into weird music like me, you've heard Madison Cunningham's new record. But anybody have anything else? Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. In this episode, I meant to mention that if you're interested in Morton Eshrick and the work of Larissa Huff, you should check out Craft in America's newest episode. And she's featured and interviewed about Morton Eshrick in that episode. I will post a link in the show notes to PBS's Craft in America. Very, very cool show. All right. If you have questions or comments you'd like answered on the show, please send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Clean up, clean up, clean up. Tidy up, clean up, clean up. Clean up, tidy up, everybody tidy up, up, up. Clean up, clean up, clean up, tidy up. Clean up, clean up, clean up, tidy up, everybody tidy up, up, up. Boom. That blows my mind.